we began a brand new series called Imago Day. Now that simply means the image of God. And we're going to be looking at the implications of what that means to be made in the image of God. Over the next several weeks, we're going to talk about God's image. What is that? We're going to talk about racism and prejudice, how that has no part in the life of a Christian. We're going to talk about your purpose. We're going to talk about sex and gender, that we have a culture today that is confused. We have a culture today that often rejects absolute truth. And so we're going to look at what the Bible actually says about sex and gender. We're going to look at what it means to reign. Did you know that God called us to reign in life? And what does that mean? Uh, What are the spiritual implications of that? And then we're going to learn how to relate to each other because we are made in the image of God. So over the next several weeks, we're going to be talking about these things. And uh, today we're going to talk about what it means to be created in the image of God. And the title of the message today is this, you have great value. You have great value. Value. I want you to turn to the person sitting next to you and say, you're worth a lot. You are. A person is worth. You know how you can tell what a person is worth? You can tell what something is worth by what someone is willing to pay for it. Okay? I, I've seen some ridiculous things that people paid a whole lot of money for. Uh, basketball shoes that were worn by famous basketball players. And people pay hundreds of thousands of dollars for them. Now, are those shoes worth that much? Well, only because somebody's willing to pay that much for it. Do you know what you're worth? God paid the ultimate price for you because Jesus Christ died in your place. That's how much value you have that the Son of God, God, uh, the second person of the Trinity, was willing to come to this earth, become human, and die in your place. That's how much value you have. So we're going to talk about today, you have great value. And I want to today answer two simple questions. And we're going to look at that. So uh, Genesis chapter 1, this is going to be our text, uh, not the only verses we're going to read, but this is going to be our foundational text for the next several weeks. First, uh, I'm sorry, Genesis chapter 1, verse 26. And then God said, let us make mankind in our image. Do you notice that he uses the plural there? Now, does that mean that there are multiple gods? No, that's, I believe, the first sense in Scripture that we get of that God is a trinity. One God, three persons, Father, Son, and Spirit. So he says, let us make mankind in our image. And so mankind has been made in the image of God. According to our likeness, and by the way, God has made us to reflect him. Now, the Bible is very clear that uh, God is spirit and those that worship him must worship in spirit and truth. And so whenever we see in in the word of God that, uh, for example, the Bible talks about the arm of the Lord. Now, does God actually have an arm? Well, if God's spirit, then he does not. But that is a metaphor used to describe God, and it attributes physical aspects to God. But because we are made in the image of God and in the likeness of God, we reflect who God is. So he said, let us make man in our image uh, according to our likeness, and let them Rule over the fish of the sea. How many fishermen are in here? Raise your hand. How many like to fish? Raise your hand. A few people. Uh, Some of you are, I know what happened. Uh, The people that like to fish are out fishing today. They're not in church. That's what happened. (laughs) Let them rule over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the sky and over the livestock and over all the earth. And over every crawling thing that crawls on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. And God blessed them. 
And God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. And subdue it and rule over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the sky and over every living thing that moves on the earth. Then God said, behold, I've given you every plant yielding seed that is on the surface of the earth and every tree which has fruit yielding seed. It shall be food for you and every animal of the earth and every bird of the sky and everything that moves on the earth which has life, I've given every green plant for food. And it was so. And God saw all that he had made, and behold, it was very good. And there was evening, and there was morning, the sixth day. So in this, we see that God, in his wisdom, in his grace, in his love, he created mankind in his own image. And he gave us a purpose. He gave us a charge, a challenge, a command. He said, I want you to do some things here on this earth. And so today I want to just simply ask a couple of questions, answer a couple of questions. And the first one is this. What does it mean to be made in the image of God? What are the implications of that? And you may think, well, that's not that big of a deal. That's not that important. Actually, it is very important. And it's, it's critically important for our culture today. Much of our culture has rejected absolute truth, has rejected God, and we began to get kind of even silly in our beliefs. We get ideas that there are no differences between men and women. Now, we're both human. We're both made in the image of God. But as we're going to see, man and woman both have a very specific role, a complementary role that God has called us to fulfill together. Um, so it is incredibly important, especially in this culture today, to know what it means to be made in the image of God and why uh, that God did that. Well, there's a few things that it means. Number one, it means that all humans have great value. You are created in God's image. That's what makes you human. And because you are created in the image of God, it gives us implication about the value of human life. All human life has value. Every human being that you ever lay eyes on was one for whom Jesus Christ died. Now think about the importance of that and the power of that. The truth is we all get aggravated at people. We all find people that we don't like. There are leaders that we don't like. There are politicians that we don't like. There are neighbors that we don't like. And for most, there are even family members that you don't like. But you have never locked eyes with a human being that God does not love. You have never locked eyes with a human being that Jesus Christ did not die for. And so what it means to be created in the image of God is that all humans have great value. It also means that you can have a relationship with God. Now think about that. Animals are a part of God's creation, but animals do not have a relationship with God. I think it could be argued that, God, that animals are in subjection to God, of course, but animals do not have the kind of spirit that we have, and therefore they are not spiritual beings, and they cannot relate to God the way that human beings can. But because you're created in the image of God, Solomon wrote it this way in the book of Ecclesiastes. He said it this way, that God has put eternity in the human heart. Why is it that every human, no matter where they're born, no matter when they're born in time, no matter what culture they're born in, no matter what religion they're born under, that every human has this desire, and some don't recognize it. Some even become atheists. They reject this desire. They reject the fact that they were created to be in a relationship with God, often because they don't want to be held accountable for their actions. But why is it that in every culture there's prayer? Why is it that in every tribe known throughout history, there's prayer? Why? Because we are created in the image of God and we are created to have a relationship with God. Being created in the image of God means that you're a relational being. It means that God created you to love you. 
Now think about that. We often get depressed. We often get discouraged. We often think, well, what is the purpose of my life? I'm not that important. I don't really contribute that much. Nobody's going to miss me when I'm gone. Uh, It doesn't really matter what I do because I'm not that talented. Nobody really knows who I am. But understand this. God made you to love you. But wait a minute. That's not the end of that. He made you to love you forever. Now, to be able to be with God, to be in heaven, it means we've got to come into that relationship with Jesus Christ. We've got to come into that right relationship with God. But God, for believers, he is going to spend all of eternity loving you. Isn't that incredible? That's all because you're made in the image of God. It means that you were created by God. Now, there are questions, and and I'll be honest with you, there are some Christians that um, maybe they don't look at science much, and maybe they don't consider it much. Uh, But And there's room for different opinions. Uh, There's room for different theories about what creation was like or how long it took. But understand something. In Genesis, the point of the first few chapters of Genesis is not to give you a science lesson. God didn't do that, okay? The point was to show you that God is the creator of everything and that mankind, as human beings, we are to be in subjection to God. He created us to be worship, uh, to worship him. He created us to love him. He created us so that he would love us and be in relationship with us. And the whole point of creation is this, that God created you and that he loves you and that he wants to have a relationship with you. Now, when you're having a bad day, if you'll think about that, it'll help you. It'll help you get through the day. You are created by God. It also means that you are created for a purpose. And I want you to hear me when I say this, and especially those of you online today. You're not an accident. God didn't make an oops when he made you. God didn't just have a few leftover parts and say, well, I'll just kind of throw this together and see what happens. God made you for a purpose and on purpose. You're not an accident. God knew who you were before you were ever born. Now, I got to be honest with you. There are some famous people and powerful people that they don't know my name. They have no idea that I exist. But you know what? The God of the universe knows who I am. And the God of the universe knows who you are. You were created on purpose and for a purpose. Words that we find in this text help us understand why God created us. Listen to some of these words. Words like rule. He said, I want you to rule over creation. To subdue. To have dominion over. To be fruitful. To multiply and fill the earth. These indicate that God has given to us a divine purpose. There's a reason you're here. And if there's a reason you're here, then there's a reason that God wants you to exist and there's a job for you to do. I often interact with people that don't think it matters whether they go to church or not. Those of you online, watch, listen carefully. It matters. It matters. You see, it matters if you show up. If, it matters if you're faithful. It matters if you serve. Why? Because God, in the fact that he created us in his image, he gave us a divine purpose. And there's a job that you should do. There's a race that you alone can run. And there's something you contribute to the family of God and to the kingdom of God. God created you on purpose and for a purpose. We are to love God and to be loved by him. And we are to live in covenant with God and his people. And as a result of that, these words that we see in this text, we understand that we are to reign in life. In other words, we are not to be victims, but we can be victors through Jesus Christ. 
In the New Testament, it says it this way. When you become a follower of Jesus, listen closely, it says that you are a conqueror. In fact, it says you're more than a conqueror. God says about you when you come into relationship with Jesus Christ by faith, he says that you are now a son or a daughter of God. It, the Bible calls us kings and priests. In other words, we are uh, to be in this spiritual relationship and a rule. We're to be in submission to God, but God has given us a purpose, something to hold on to, something to live for, we're to be kings and priests. God says that we're more than conquerors. God says that we can be filled with the Spirit of God. God says that we can have love and joy and peace. And it is through the power of the Holy Spirit working through us. Think about this. Because you're made in the image of God. And when you come into a relationship with God, get this. God works through. Have you ever thought about spiritual gifts and I know that's a completely different subject, but God tells us in the New Testament that when we get saved, God gives every person at least one spiritual gift. And what is the purpose of a spiritual gift? It is God working through you to bless others. It is God working through you for his kingdom, for his purpose. It is God working through you to build up the church, to build up the body of Christ. Now think about that. God designed you to be in relationship with him. Why? So he could work through you. That's pretty incredible, isn't it? I mean, when you think about the importance of that, uh, it's important that we understand that we're made in the image of God. Uh, being made in the image of God means that the sexes matter. I realize we live in a culture that uh, many people reject that. I, I realize we live in a difficult time. Some people are afraid to talk about this. They're afraid to address it because they're afraid they'll get canceled. They're, they're afraid that somebody will mock them. But I want you to hear what the Bible says. It says that we are created male and female. Isn't it interesting that the words that we read in our English translation of the Bible, they come from the Hebrew words. The Hebrew Bible uh, that word for man, it's referring to mankind. So when God created man, it doesn't mean that he just created a man. It means that he created humankind. He created mankind. And he said, I've created them male and female. Male and female. If you wonder how many sexes there are, just go to the Bible. There's male and there's female. Okay? Now I realize that we've got to be... Um, aware of others, love others, no matter what they believe, no matter where they are. We've got to be evangelistic. We've got to be kind. I understand that. But the Bible's pretty clear about it, isn't it? That God created us male and female. The attack on sexual identity is actually an attack on the image of God and the purpose of God. Hear what I'm saying? It is an attack on the purpose of God. Men were created for a very specific purpose. Women were created for a very specific purpose. We are complementary to each other, okay? Now, once again, there are, some, there are some things that every man, every woman in the same way are created for. We're created for a relationship with God, men and women both. We are created to serve God, men and women both. We are created to lead in our home, men and women both. We are created to make a difference, men and women both. Those are the same. We're created to worship God, men and women both. But there are some specific things that God has called men to do and women to do that no amount of juggling words or uh, that kind of thing, not, it can't. Uh, it can't make, it can't change it, in other words. Men were created to be priest, prophet, provider, and protector. The idea that men are toxic is a lie from the enemy. Hear what I'm saying? Now, can men be toxic? Yes. Because of sin. Do we know men that are toxic? I'm sure you do. There are men that because they don't serve God, they don't uh, stay aware of their relationship with God, that they are irresponsible. And yes, they can be toxic. Uh, men are to be responsible. And when they don't follow God's plan, 
when they become uh, one that abdicates their responsibility in life, when they look at pornography, when they don't work, when they fail to lead, then they become toxic. But God, listen, God has called men to be a leader, to lead in the home, to lead in the church. Not exclusively, God also calls women, don't misunderstand what I'm saying, but men, God has given you a responsibility. And when you pursue that, when you become the protector of your home, when you become the provider of your home, that doesn't mean that men alone work. Don't, I don't know where people get some of this stuff from. Uh, the Bible is pretty clear that women work all throughout Scripture. Read the book of Proverbs about uh, the woman who is uh, far more valuable than rubies. Uh, you'll probably pick up from Proverbs chapter 31 that she was a small business owner. Okay, The idea that um, women never work outside the home is, is really foreign to Scripture. Okay, But the truth of the matter is, men, God has called you to be a provider. Now, if your wife makes more money than you, hallelujah, praise God. Uh, I wish that my wife made more money than me, okay? Uh, it's funny. I I'll just kind of share this personal story. My dad, um, for many years, he was the primary breadwinner, and by that I mean uh, that he made more money than my mother did. My mother, she started her own business. She began to make more money than my dad. Uh, then she went into the insurance business, and she made a whole lot more money than my dad did, and she made quite a bit of money. And i never forget having this conversation with my father. It began to bother him. It really began to bother him that my mom made, she made probably five times as much money as he did. And, and he just he began to complain about it and all this stuff. And I said, Dad! If you don't want the money, give it to me. I'll take it. And he's like, what do you mean? I said, look, I wish that my wife would make more money than I do. Doesn't mean I'd sit at home and watch television. But the fact is, that would be a blessing. Finally, I told him, I said, look, Dad, uh, if you want to, uh, you know, stop living the way you live, that's fine. Mom can stop working and stay at home but you're going to live on what you make. And he goes, hmm, maybe I'll be okay with her working and make what she makes. In fact, my dad did a lot of stuff. Uh, my parents, you know, did well financially. And I remember my dad, he had a shop out behind his house, and he bought a $10,000 lift as a garage for his cars so he could change his oil, Okay. I mean, a professional lift that you would see in a place that changes oil. And I said to my dad, I said, Dad, why did you spend $10,000 on a lift? He said, do you know how expensive it is to get an oil change? I said, it ain't $10,000. <laughs> he said, I ain't going to pay them that money. And I'm like, yeah, you're saving like $8 by letting them do it. I said, it takes a whole a lot of oil changes to add up to $10,000, Dad. I think he got okay with my mom making more money than he did. And he, here's the point. Don't miss what I'm saying. God has called men to be provider. It doesn't mean you have to make the most money. It just means that God has called you to work, to provide, to protect, to lead, to be responsible um, women were created by God as an equal in Genesis, but it also, uh, interesting word, God used the word helper. He said, I will create for Adam a helper that is suitable for him. Now, the interesting thing about that Hebrew word that's translated helper, it is the same word that God used to describe himself. Very interesting. Here's what he said. He called himself the helper of Israel. In other words, he was the Savior. He was the one that brought it together. And women, for those of you who are married, listen closely. You are, in a very real sense, a helper like God is the helper of us. That you bring it together. That you are, if, you, if I can use this word without you misunderstanding, the Savior of your home. It doesn't mean that 
you're in place of Jesus Christ. That's not what I'm saying. But God has put within your strength, within your power, to be the one that helps set the tone for the home. And I really do believe this. God has not called husbands or wives to manipulate each other, but to assist each other. Read in Scripture in the New Testament. It's very important um, that God has called us not to be fulfilled in marriage, but to serve the other in marriage. That's our job. And when we do that, then and only then can we have a happy, truly biblical, God-blessed marriage. Um, the fact is that God has called us to serve and to serve one another. God has called us to be the helper. God has called us to lead. God has called us to uh, take command, to rule. Once again, these words that God used, uh, it's interesting that he gave these commands to rule, to reign, to subdue, to work, to fill the earth, to multiply, and fill the earth with, with worshipers. He gave it to both men and women. And that means that it's your job as a believer, whether you're a man or a woman, to do what God commanded us to do in the very beginning, to fill the earth with worshipers. That's ultimately what the job uh, is. It's what the job description is. We're to fill the earth. When he told them to fill the earth, what was he saying? Not just have a lot of kids. He was saying that. But he was saying this. You fill this earth with people who love me. You fill this earth with people who are going to have a relationship with me. And just like Bosco preached last week, our responsibility is to evangelize. is to share the good news of Jesus Christ with others so that they too can be a part of those who fill the earth with God's people. Well, it means that you've been blessed to be made in the image of God. Did you catch what God said? He created them and then he blessed them. It is possible for you to be blessed by God. It is possible for you to live a blessed life. Now, for most people, for uninitiated, for people that don't know Scripture, we, uh, anybody ever get this when you're out, uh, a cashier is checking you out and they say, have a blessed day. Well, I love that because they're being very kind and I think they're being biblical, okay? But a lot of people don't know what that means. For some people to say, I've got a blessed life means that, well, I don't have any problems. Well, good luck finding that, okay? That doesn't exist. Uh, you'll find that where you find uh, unicorns and Alabama football fans with high IQs. Those don't exist. I'm sorry, football season's getting ready to start. I gotta get my digs in when I can, all right? Actually, uh, Shandrika, she's a nurse. She went on with us on the trip. Uh, she's getting her master's degree from University of Alabama, so I have to have the caveat. It's a very good academic school, okay? I just don't like their football program. Anyway, so. But it's okay to be second best in the SEC now, right? After Georgia? All right. So anyway, I've, I've stopped preaching and I've gone to meddling. All right. So let me get back to preaching, okay? You've been blessed. You've been blessed by being created in the image of God. But it doesn't mean that you're going to have no problems when you say I'm blessed. It doesn't mean that everything in life just you know, I've got lots of money in the bank account. That's not what it means to be blessed. To be blessed means to live on purpose for God, to live with God's blessings in your life. That you're connected to the Heavenly Father. That you know what it's like that no matter what you go through in this life, that everything is going to be okay. That's why, did you know that most of the time, not all the time, but most of the time in the Old Testament, the Hebrew word for the word blessed, we read that word blessed, is the man or the woman. Blessed, we, we, it's a singular word in English. Do you know that in Hebrew, it's a plural word? You know what it means? Blessed, blessed. Happy, happy. 
Happy, happy is the man or the woman that serves God. Happy, happy is the man or the woman that puts God first in their life. Blessed, blessed is the man or the woman that serves God, that has a relationship with God. What does that mean? It means that you're doubly blessed. It means that you're blessed now and in the life to come. It means that you get the best of this world because God is with you and you get heaven to boot. There is no better way to live. Now, this is what God says. It's possible for you to have that life. You ever have things happen to you where you don't feel blessed? You ever have instances, moments when it feels like that God's picking on you? That God's forgotten you? Don't despair if you ever feel that. There's an entire book of the Bible that is filled with these kind of sentiments. It's called the book of Psalms. Read the book of Psalms, especially the first third of the Psalms, and find out how often David started off writing a psalm because he was complaining. Seems like the heavens are brass. Oh, God, I, I thought you were there, but it didn't feel like you were. My enemies are conquering me. The bad people are the ones that are winning in life. And it just seems like he goes over and over and over. I call that vertical venting. It's okay to tell God how you feel. By the way, he knows anyway. <laughs> you might as well be honest with him, okay? It's not like he goes, oh my goodness, I'm shocked uh, that you feel that way. He already knows. But if you'll find, if you'll follow David, there's a pattern. He starts out saying, hey, you know, I, I feel like, God, that you're not there, that you've, you've forgotten about me. But at the end, he always comes back, but Lord, you're my Savior. God, you are the one that uh, is always with me. God, you are the one that I trust. God says you can be blessed. It means that you can bring glory to God with your life, and it also means that people matter to God. Psalm 139, 13, you made all the delicate inner parts of my body and knit me together in my mother's womb. Before you were ever born, God had plans for you. Jeremiah 1, 5, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. This is God speaking. Before you were born, I set you apart for my holy purpose. Isn't that amazing? Before you were ever born, God had a plan for you. He said, I'm going to create this woman. I'm going to create this man for my purpose. It matters if you're faithful. It matters what you do. It matters a lot. Well, the second question, and I've only got a couple minutes to answer this one, so I'll, I'll just kind of hit some highlights here. How does sin affect the image of God? I'm created in the image of God. What does that mean? Well, we already talked about that. But yes, we know the story that Adam and Eve sinned in the Garden of Eden, and every person since has sinned. You're born in sin. I'm born in sin. There's no one who is perfect, and anyone who says that they've never sinned is a liar, and that's a sin, so it's a lose-lose situation to claim that. So does that mean that we are no longer in the image of God? What does that mean? Well, I believe that sin did mar us, but it did not destroy God's image in us. Why? Well, there are several passages of Scripture that show that even though that we are sinful human beings, God says humanity is still in the image of God. Uh, James 3, 9, with the tongue, we bless our Lord and Father, and with it, we curse people who are made in the likeness of God. So that's a long time after uh, the Garden of Eden and sin, and God says we're still in the image of God. Genesis 9, 6, this was many years after uh, the Garden of Eden. And here's what God said. If anyone takes a human life, that person's life will also be taken by human hands. For God made human beings in his own image. So yes, sin has marred us, but we are still in the image of God. Colossians 3.10, uh, when you get saved, he says, uh, you're redeemable because of Jesus. He said, you have become a new person. This new person is continually renewed to be like its creator. So what does this mean for Christians? Well, I'm gonna to end today reading a passage from 2 Corinthians chapter five from the message paraphrase. And I love this because being made in the image of God 
even though we have been marred by sin, we can have a relationship with God. We are redeemable because of Jesus Christ. And here's the implication for each of us. We don't evaluate people by what they have or how they look. That's why we say bringing people wherever they are into a growing relationship with Jesus Christ. God says that humans look on the outward appearance. We, we look at talent, we look at looks, we look at money. But God says, don't be impressed by that. He says, however, we looked at the Messiah that way once and got it all wrong. As you know, we certainly don't look at him that way anymore. In other words, people looked at Jesus and they didn't see him as the son of God. They made a mistake. He said, now we look inside. And what we see is that anyone united with the Messiah gets a fresh start and is created new. Aren't you glad that God does that for us? Aren't you glad that no matter what your past is like, it doesn't have to affect your future? Look, the fact is God saves and he forgives and he changes. And, and look, yes, you can't undo the sin, but it can be forgiven. You can't undo the sin. Here's what God said. As far as the east is from the west, that's how far I've removed it from you. He said, I will remember your sins no more. Is God forgetful? No. He willfully removes it and doesn't remember it anymore. Now, that's good news. That's good news. You say, well, how far is that? Well, just take a globe. You can start on the north pole and you can trace your finger down that globe and you'll eventually get to the south pole. And when you pass that, you know what? You're not going south any longer. You're going north. North, south. North, south. Take your finger and start going east on that globe. That's west. Here, here's east. You start going east. You're going to go east one time. Two times, a thousand times, a million times, a trillion times. In other words, infinity. You will always be going east. Take that same finger and start going west. A trillion times, a trillion, you're still going west. Here's what God said. I have removed your sins as far as infinity is from infinity. That's good news. He said, I have forgiven your sin. You get a fresh start. The old life is gone. A new life emerges. Look at it. All this comes from God who settled the relationship between us and him and then called us to settle our relationships with each other. That's the, the, the purpose that we're here for. We're to evangelize. We're to bring people into the family of God. We're to settle those conflicts. We are to do everything in our power to live in that loving relationship with others. God put the world square with himself through the Messiah, giving the world a fresh start by offering forgiveness of sins. And God has given us the task of telling everyone what he is doing. We're Christ's representatives. God uses us to persuade men and women to drop their differences and enter into God's work of making th things right between them, between God and them. We're speaking for Christ himself now. now. Now get the implication of being made in the image of God. God says, now you're my mouthpiece. Now you're my representative. Are you marred by sin? Yes. But when you come into a relationship with God, you have been forgiven. And you've been put in right relationship with God. And God has called you. He wants to use you to make a difference. Why? Because we're created in the image of God. He wants to love people forever. He created us to love us. He said, so now we're speaking for Christ himself. Become friends with God. He's already a friend with you. Uh, that's so beautiful. So God calls us to live out in his image to love others because they are made in the image of God. He calls us to be his representatives. He called us, called us to tell others about this good news. He calls us to be a friend of God. 
because he's already made friendship with us. Heavenly Father, I pray that you'd help each of us to be friends with God. Help us to live out our purpose. Help us to follow you in all that we do. Before I finish my prayer, I wonder what is God saying to you? Just keep your head bowed for a moment. Is God speaking to you today? Was something that was said from the word of God particularly convicting in your life? Did it spur a thought? Did it bring a name to your mind of someone you need to help resolve a relationship issue with? Maybe it reminded you of why you're here. Maybe it spurred you to be faithful. What is God saying to you? What do you believe about God and yourself? Maybe you came in here today down on yourself and down on humanity and down on the potential that God has put in your life. And maybe God spoke to you about that. Whatever your prayer is today, we have a prayer team that will be available for you at the end of the service. And uh, they're willing to pray for you. And you can pray about anything. Maybe you need to have healing in your life. Or maybe you need to deal with a relationship. Or maybe you've got a question about God. Or maybe you've got um, a, an issue at your work. Or maybe you have some financial problems. Whatever it is, it doesn't matter. But you can pray. Maybe you want to trust Christ as your Savior today. I would challenge you today, online and in the room, trust Jesus as your Savior. You say, how do I do that? Pray something like this. Dear Jesus, I believe you're the Son of God. I believe you died for my sin on the cross and that you rose from the grave. I'm asking you into my life today to save me, to change me, to lead my life, to be the Lord of my life. Please save me today. If you prayed that prayer today online, please click at the bottom of the screen that let us know that you prayed to receive Christ. If you're in the room today, please fill out that next step card and put on there that you receive Christ. Drop it in the drop box on the way out. Father, help us to live for you today because we have been made in the image of God. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Amen. Look right this way for just a minute. Um, next week, we're talking about our next steps. We're going to have next step class this week. If you're new to our church and you'd like to go through that, it's only about 30 minutes. It starts at 1030. It's during the first part of the service. And yes, I will get back in time to preach. Uh, and so we will be doing that next week. We've got some people that are going through it. And if you'd like to go through it as well, then you can just show up and then walk down to the end of the hallway and they'll show you right where that classroom is and you can go through the next step class and become a part of our church. Um, and so if you'd like to do that, um, if you'd like to be baptized, let us know that, mark it on a card, drop it in the drop box on the way out. And next week, we are gonna be sharing some video and pictures of the uh, people that went on the trip. And uh, you don't want to miss that. In fact, I'm going to have them. They're all in here. Kayla, Shandrika, Jose, would you guys stand? Everyone stand. Jose's in the back. Wave your hand, Jose. All right. And thank you. You guys can be seated. I was so proud of our team. Man, they just did such a phenomenal job. And uh, I'll let them tell you next week. But they grew. They took their next steps. It was, it was a phenomenal trip. And so I hope you'll uh, be here next week to hear that and to be a part of what's going on here at our church. Don't forget the small groups start next week. And if you'd like to be a part of one uh, and you're not, then you can let us know. Okay? Let's everyone stand together. Thank you for being here today. I love you.